Good morning, everyone. My name is Jennifer Wallinga, and I am a professor in the School of Communication and Culture at Royal Roads University. Welcome to our webinar series, Sport, Leadership, and Social Change. For this episode, we are joined by a number of people who are part of a project called the True Athlete Project, and or TAP. And they have many programs, mentoring and uh, powered by purpose, which is about finding some sort of a project that you want to work on uh, as an athlete. And any anyone can really take part. It's, it's a fabulous program. So I wanted to introduce everyone in Canada to uh, the great people that uh, have initiated the program, but also participate within it. Love this visual, of course, with the sunrise and the rowing. I, I just kind of came off the lake, Elk Lake in Victoria, BC myself and had quite a spectacular morning. The weather just seems to great every day. So always so appreciative. I come to you, of course, from the lands of the Kwangan and Kosepsin First Nations communities. And we always want to thank them for allowing us to teach and learn, live, work and play on their lands, their unceded territories, as we all know now. And it's important that we all begin by acknowledging the truth of, of our historical past and, and some of the harms that were committed and uh, take responsibility for healing from those harms and also take responsibility for reconciling how we behave today, our structures, processes, behaviors, and making sure that they align with our, our values, which are really fundamentally about respect and equity. Always like to introduce our university a little bit as well and, and situate the webinar within this university because our learning teaching research model really does align well with this concept of social change and leadership is really the, the pillars of, of what we do at Royal Roads. It's very much a social purpose institution, a public university that caters really to working professionals who are returning to their, uh, their educational journeys in all shapes and forms. Uh, it's all founded on these three principles of being applied, community-based and caring and transformational. Life.changing is our mantra. Now we're trying to help people experience the power of transformation in order to facilitate that in others. And of course, we rely heavily on our campus and our the lands, the 300 hectares of old growth forest and the, the Harrow Strait beyond the Esquimalt Lagoon that we nestle up uh, alongside of and uh, the fabulous gardens that we are then the caretakers for. And we leverage these in all of our programs, whether it's business or leadership communication or the environment, we, we really draw on the power of nature and, and the land to uh, weave that into our learning and teaching. And I bring my background in sport. I, I believe there's truth in sport like there is in nature. And we have so much to learn from sport, sport when it's facilitated well and at its, real, at its best really. Uh, I always say that this little boat teaches me something every morning, and I definitely had some epiphanies today and saw my beloved heron, which is constantly reminding me to be patient and graceful, um, but also determined. This bridge is on our campus, and it is the iconic bridge, a uh, real metaphor for communication for our school. The idea of minding and bridging the gaps is fundamental and, and very similar to the principles we learn through sport, the idea of acknowledging difference, uh, that we our teams are our performances really hinge on diversity and uh, it's about leveraging diversity, drawing on the strengths of every unique individual that participates and finding a way to find a role for everyone. You need to start by minding the gap, the diversity before we can actually build those bridges. And I, I love sport. I love sport so much because I do think it is such a microcosm. It's a mirror for our society. Uh, what is happening in society is often then uh, elaborated upon or exacerbated within sport, within that context. And But sport also has the power because it has such a reach. It is the most engaged in, most uh, watched endeavor uh, of humankind, really. And so it has huge power to influence. And when done well, again, it has the power to model and, in, in, and engage, activate people for positive social change. There are so many organizations across the world. And again, I, I really feel that the programs at Rural Roads, our school and where I am situated is reflective of a lot of these principles that are guiding these kinds of programs and movements of development and diversity, education, environment, equity, health, communication, and peace. 
We also uh, partner with sport in a really unique way in that we have a flexible admission process that acknowledges professional experience and that goes for athletes as well. So I always wanna highlight that to anyone who has uh, interactions with athletes or are athletes themselves either competing or recently retired. I mean, to think about how you can leverage what you've learned through sport and bring it to your learning journey. Uh, we actually count it for credit at Royal Road. So it's important for you to, to know that and also know that we have programs around uh, sport, specifically sport, but you can customize any of our programs to meet the needs of a, a sport uh, inquiry or research or project that you're interested in. But we also have uh, some courses and partnerships with, with organizations like the CFL Players Association and Game Plan. So for this episode, we are going to explore the concept of sport leadership and sport as uh, education, really. I just recently returned from the SCRI conference, the Sport Canada Research Initiative uh, related to this, the CIRC, CIRC that many of you will be reading their newsletters, but that's a oh, 50, I think 50 year old, yes, they had their birthday this year, um, institution and initiative that fosters and shares and promotes research within the sport realm in Canada. And at this conference, much of the conversation had to do with, you know, the power of sport, the purpose of sport, what are we really trying to accomplish through sport, in sport, and I think most would agree it is a form of education and that we have much to learn through it, but we also have much to learn from sport, again, when facilitated well. And there are, I met many people at the conference, of course, but there are so many innovative programs across our country that truly leverage sport for human and social development. And globally, this is going on, of course, as well. So I wanted to highlight a few of these and highlight this concept that sport is really for human development, yes, physically, certainly, but also, of course, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, that it all coalesces in that um, striving for an optimal performance. And, and it's for also social development, right? It's not just for these little individuals, but for the sake of the broader social good, right? That uh, when we create these little leaders that go out into the community and are great citizens, fabulous, but um, that is the purpose, right? To, to foster wonderful human beings through this endeavor. Uh, so they develop themselves physically, but also mentally, so, and emotionally, socially, socio-emotionally, and uh, spiritually. So we have lots of different kinds of programs that tackle that kind of approach. And today we'll be meeting people from the True Athlete Project, uh, specifically the Powered by Purpose program. So I'll, have, I'll ask them to tell us more about the program. Of course, I participated in, in it as a, as a mentor and as someone who delivers a seminar on, on creative thinking as people try to formulate the project that they want to uh, galvanize around and pursue. And you'll hear about some of the projects that uh, these young people have uh, undertaken. And we'll be meeting David Smith. And David Smith, I encourage everybody to have a look at his Wikipedia. I think he must be the most decorated athlete in the UK, uh, maybe the world. <laughs> it's quite remarkable. I say multiple Paralympic champion, but it is remarkable how many successes this individual has enjoyed and, uh, and achieved in the sport of boccia. We'll also meet Imogen Grant, uh, a real hero of mine. I, I follow her closely. She's a rower and a multiple world and a European champion and pursuing the Olympics, sitting very comfortably in a gold medal position, I would say right now with her partner. Uh, we'll also meet Georgia Holt and Georgia Holt and I got to know each other quite well. I was working with her on her project last year. She's a cyclist and a tandem pilot uh, and a world champion and Commonwealth medalist. And she'll talk probably about her project as well. And this is Lawrence Halstead and Lawrence I, and I met, I think, because of Kath Bishop, a friend of mine through rowing, and who also is a, an activist in the realm of sport. And, and so the two of us met and then quickly saw all sorts of things that we, uh, that we enjoyed together and, and had overlap and interests. He's a fencer, an author, and he's the head of mentoring with the True Athlete Project. So wonderful facilitator. And we'll be uh, hearing all sorts about their projects, the, the project itself, True Athlete Project, and, um, and talk a little bit more about sport as that vehicle for, for learning and social transformation or positive change. All right, so welcome everybody. So great to see everybody. And I've uh, shared just how much I admire everyone in our group today. 
and how I follow their careers and their endeavors and, and uh, really want to highlight to our audience that these are fantastic individuals you want to get to know and stalk a little bit yourselves. Uh, I would start by asking people and we'll just do a bit of a round table and then we'll have more of a conversation but tell us a bit more about your role you know what, what it is that keeps you busy and focused right now the work you're doing uh, within sport and and I know all of you are involved in in TAP and so have had projects that you've been working on so I'd love to hear a little bit more about that too and I know some of you have many interests uh, and that's fine talk as much as you want about the kinds of things you're doing in and through sport for positive social change how about if we just start with David because I know David is with us for part of the webinar maybe not the whole webinar so let's hear from him and and pull from him as much as we can go ahead David welcome Hey, yeah, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm David Smith OBE. I'm a Paralympic champion in the sport of boccia. Um, I've been playing the sport for 19 years now. Um, and uh, sort of my purpose within sport is to try and, as I've got older, to try and um, encourage the growth of the sport within the UK um, and, and wider. Um, I, I, I see boccia as one of the most inclusive Paralympic sports. So I see it as an opportunity to make um, inclusive physical education. Um, for those that maybe don't necessarily fit the mold when it comes to football, netball, rugby, et cetera, um, there's a sport that they can at least uh, take part in sort of competitive activities. Um, so I'm currently working in, in South Wales at the moment around setting up potentially a boccia league and just going into primary schools and just getting uh, getting the children focusing on something a little bit different. Um, and yeah, just uh, trying to spread a little bit of uh, inclusivity. So yeah, that's... That's my thing. And I also do a little bit of lifestyle coaching as well. So I, you know, uh, for adults, a uh, little bit of nutrition advice and just trying to help people level up their own uh, lifestyles um, as much as possible um, in the face of a currently uh, difficult climate. So just trying to keep spread the positivity as much as possible. Love it. And and I've, I've been seeing some of the things you're involved in fabulous. And I, I would think that the work you're doing about spreading the word of the power of Baccia and the inclusivity of Baccia as part of your project, probably through through triathlete project, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. That's been my main uh, focus. It's been it's been interesting to try and sort of how I go about doing it. What what's the uh, because it's it, you can start everywhere <laughs> with Baccia. There's so, there's so much growth potential. Um, it's sort of like knowing where to start. So I've I've kind of decided that I would start at the bottom um and uh yeah because i feel like the, the children are the future so if we uh if we can engage their minds early um then as they grow up hopefully they take sport with them um doesn't necessarily have to be botcher but um just gives them something um outlets community building all that sort of stuff so yeah oh absolutely right it's a big issue in canada with the drop in participation and the struggle to get kids involved in sport in general what would you say uh, you've taken from Baccia? Yes, inclusive, and you've noticed that through your experience. What else has the sport really taught you, do you think? Um, well, because of the nature of my disability, um, Boccia is probably the only sport that I could have possibly played at the Paralympics. Um, so Boccia has given me the opportunity to uh, be a, as competitive as I want to be. Um, and uh, yeah, there's always another competition. There's always a bigger challenge. Um, it's also enabled me to travel around the world uh, in an electric wheelchair, to learn to live independently and manage my time around all the other bits that come along with a severe disability, like social care and uh, trying to live independently with uh, society not always being as uh, as uh, f as independent as you could be. Maybe uh, society sometimes likes to throw barriers in the way, so I've got quite good at jumping over them, um, figuratively speaking. Um, so, so yeah. Love it. Thank you very much. And how about Imogen? Can you tell us a little bit about uh, your role, what you're busy doing right now, what you're focusing on in and through sport? Yeah. Um, my name is Imogen. Uh, I'm a GB rower, um, which takes up the majority of my time at the moment. Um, but I also like to do a lot of different things. And that's kind of where TAP really came in. Uh, I recently graduated from a medical degree at Cambridge. Um, and since then, my focus has really been turned to um, using sport and specifically through British rowing and rowing, given it's my sport, um, to try and further the sustainability agenda 
um, and try and improve the sustainability of sports in general. And in my um, case, rowing, um, I've been working with a charity called the Rivers Trust um, and I've recently become an ambassador for them. Um, and there's a lot of really exciting things going on behind the scenes that I get to be privy to um, in terms of meetings that are happening between some of the um, NGBs in the UK um, to see if we can start moving forward with a bit more uh, collective action um, to try and improve specifically rivers health in, in the UK, uh, but more widely use sport as a vessel to improve sustainability more widely. Yeah, it certainly is so important right now, right? We're seeing in Canada as well, so many lakes, rivers are threatened, flooding as well, right? Has been, uh, so climate change is having a huge impact and, and who better to be spokespersons for this big change. Thank you. And Georgia. Uh, hello, I'm Georgia Holt, uh, world champion tandem pilot and Commonwealth Games medalist from uh, 2022. Um, and now I'm a veterinary medicine student. <laughs> so everything's changed a bit uh, over last year, but my main interests were kind of sparked when TAP came about um, and we were offered the opportunity to join the Power by Purpose program. Um, my main focuses at the time were the um i hope you're trying to change the commonwealth games rule of the medal allocation policy um i piloted sophie unwin and we were due to get a bronze medal but due to the excuse my dog um due to the medal allocation policy we didn't get a bronze medal despite having raced for it um so part of the work i wanted to do was to get this changed um that's a work in progress with uh now victoria not hosting the games um, and pending a new host. Um, and then my second was um, females in sport, uh, particularly um, the conversation around periods and making this more of a um, easier talked about subject. Um, luckily I had a quite a good um, open conversation with all of my coaches about this, um, but I'm very aware that that's not typical. Um, so I was part of the Well HQ's project, uh, the Just Safe Period campaign, um, which kind of rem helped to remove the stigma around the, the word. There's over 400 euphemisms for period. So this was really important for me to just make sure that we don't carry that stigma through for any other young girls coming through. Um, like you were saying, like the dropout rate, for anyone or even people starting sport is quite high um and i have always loved sport and want other people to love it as much as i do um so yeah my next steps have recently been with the british cycling women's uh education group um where they're trying to make a new framework for the female um the female discussions and making sure that there is something in the handbook and with the new coaching structure that they're creating that there is a bit on female health um because previously there's not really been any it's just been anecdotes or not really anything based around strict studies um and now there are more and there's more coming so that's really good there's a lot of work at manchester metropolitan university um going on with that um so yeah it's been nice to be involved in that and offer my perspective as someone who came into cycling at the age of 18 i, I was quite a late starter um with that because i was a talent id athlete so um it's quite important for me to let people in cycling know that not everyone knows the beginnings of cycling um for women and that when you first search something for um how to how a female would start looking at a bike or a saddle that it just takes you to a review where it says oh this saddle's 200 grams it's lighter than that one um it's not that accessible so that's been really good to be a part of um and then my third um i've got my fingers in many pies um has been with active travel campaigns um i went to something called a kidical mass which was the most beautiful amazing experience ever um and a kidical mass is a big group of children and adults joining to uh reclaim the streets um as there's not always a cycle lane or 
safe travel routes for bikes or any form of active travel, including walking sometimes. Um, so I joined them on a Saturday morning um, to do a route through Manchester. And I think about over 300 kids came and the streets were just lined with children uh, on any type of bike. You could imagine there were kids in cargo bikes and unicycles and BMX bikes um so that was really nice and uh, I'm hopefully joining a few more groups to do with women reclaiming the streets um to lower harassment and just get more people on bikes and more people enjoying bikes and creating a better world um with the amount of pollution that we have um riding a bike can hopefully help change that Right. And you can start to see the thread that's connecting you all right around the better world, really, you know, uh, Imogen with health for humans, but also for the environment and David talking about inclusivity, accessibility, independence, and how important sport is in playing those roles, removing stigma, uh, and, and a lot around the youth, right, activating youth and making it norms for youth so we can shift perceptions and opportunities. And Lawrence, let's end with you, but it uh, I think it's a good point to bring in, you know, what, where did the Power by Purpose program even come from? How did you get involved? Uh, I know you have a background as an athlete as well. So I think that's also that common thread that we all love sport and we can see the power it possesses. Tell us a bit about that journey. Mm, thanks, Jim. Um, so I joined TAP as a volunteer back in 2016, right after I retired from my sport. So I competed in Rio. I was a fencer. And that was my my second games, but I was retiring after that. And we were all volunteers in TAP at the time. Um, so it's just we've just been on a wonderful kind of organic journey of growth with this charity. We were a US charity, still are, but just US back then. I helped us set up in the UK ostensibly as a the director of a mentoring program, creating a mentoring program that we have now as kind of this global mentoring program, which has been amazing. But Kind of later on for about five years i was a volunteer and then end of 2021 uh we'd grown enough that i could take on a, a paid role doing the stuff that i was already doing i'd been doing voluntarily for a while and um the power by purpose program came about from uk sport it's a it's their initiative quite a pioneering thing it's the first time we've ever heard about this kind of program of wanting to train elite athletes in becoming social change makers activists advocates um certainly never heard about it kind of funded and supported from the top level of elite sport organizations governing bodies so they put it out put out a tender to to people to run a program like this and it was right up our alley so with, with tap we see our kind of usp as being at the center of this venn diagram of performance well-being and social impact and basically this kind of philosophy that it's not those are not three separate parts of an athlete's journey where you do all your training to get better as an athlete and then just once a year you have a well-being workshop and then you might go into a school and take a photo with some kids and that's your social impact but actually being as you're hearing from these guys being an athlete and that journey can just be all part and parcel all are supporting each other all are kind of they're they're synergistic actually um and so this tender came out and we jumped to the chance and wonderfully got the opportunity to partner with uk sport to run the program so these three were connected by being on the pilot per program pilot cohort of the power by purpose program which was last year um and we've just we're in the middle of the second cohort now and what a joy it's been to to and privilege actually to to kind of put this program together and see what it's becoming and see seeing what it does for for people um i think we were crying out for in sport and certainly athletes are we're hearing i mean not for everybody but there's just lots of athletes now who want to want to get out more and give back more than the opportunities have been before um and this is a chance to really do that authentically and compassionately and effectively yeah so crying out for it and did would you all say that you were you felt this need to leverage your platform your learning your role as an athlete yeah can david can you Absolutely. tell me about that like what's got you so engaged in this power by purpose program 
Um, so for me, it was a so I, I obviously I've been an athlete for far too long. Um, so 19 <laughs> years at international level, and in a sport where it's not very well known, it's quite easy to get lost. Um, even when you're successful, you it is even sometimes it, trying to get in the papers is like trying to pull teeth. Um, so um, for me, it was like. I, I didn't want to just be known as some guy that chucks balls for a living. Um, that happens to be in a wheelchair as well. It was just it seemed a bit cliche. So I wanted to. I've always been ambitious, um, and uh, yeah, the I don't like ceilings. Um, and the sport, I felt like I'd hit the ceiling. Um, and yeah, it, it was lockdown really that kind of started open my mind to let's do something about this. Um, and then the powered by purpose sort of came along last year, and it just sort of it made sense to join because. I felt like I was already on that journey, so it just made sense to uh, share with other athletes who are all were all kind of looking for the same thing, really. That extra, well, the purpose is the kind of the title. So uh, to find that extra purpose, not just to be stuck in the lane of being an athlete, you know, training and competing, but actually uh, being more active members of the com community society and uh, yeah, using our platforms to inspire change. Because there's so much to learn in trying to striving to be better at chucking balls around, you know, and I, I find it with rowing, it's the same, right? We're going backwards in a boat and it seems kind of silly, but nothing silly, you know, whether it's fly fishing or going backwards in a boat, it's that idea of striving for excellence, right? So there's a great deal in just pursuit of excellence, all that learning and development that you're going through. But I love that reference to the ceiling. Okay, well, what's next beyond performance and competing, you know, because you've all reached some of those peak performances already right so where do I go from here and expanding yourself out as athletes and I'm so proud of you all I'm so pleased that it's happening and I want it in Canada Lawrence we got to talk again after <laughs> I have another idea Imogen how about you what really drew you what was your experience like where you felt like you just wanted to be powered by purpose a little more yeah I think it was um it just came along at the perfect time really uh for me um but I think it it the the need for something like powered by purpose I think has come from a real shift that we've seen in sports in the last 5 10 15 years um sports people hold just a huge amount of social capital there's so many hopes and dreams that are you know fans place upon them and it holds people's attention for a really long time. But we also know that high performance sport can be really destructive. You know, athlete A and abuse can occur within gymnastics or other sports and it can be really destructive. Um, and there has to be something more. It has to be more than just winning. It has to be worth it, even if you cross the line and have come in last place. And mm. for me, rowing and medicine coexisted for a very long time. And one of the things we're taught about in medicine is the patriarchal model of medicine. And this is maybe 50, 60 years ago. So quite a lot, a long time ago at this point. Um, and the way that medicine used to be run was very patriarchal. The doctor told the patient, this is what's wrong with you. This is what we're going to do. This is what is going to happen. And the patient, had, patient needed to sit there and go, yes, doctor, absolutely, doctor. Thank you very much, doctor, and behave. And that was it. Um, and of course, that is completely unacceptable nowadays. Um, we talk about a very holistic approach to medicine. We talk about trying to see the whole person. We talk about trying to look at things that might seem disparate and unconnected um, in terms of someone's symptoms or someone's experiencing uh, experiences and connect them together. Um, and that's really fundamental to how medicine is taught. And it really strikes me that there are so many parallels with the change that's is happening within sports um you know it used to be okay for the coach to go you the athlete you need to do this and the athlete to go yes coach absolutely coach don't you know the coach asks you to jump the athlete says how high um and they were very much an athlete was very much seen as a means to an end it was all worth it if you got that gold medal if you just followed the rules and did it and i feel like that same shift that happened in medicine 50 or 60 years ago has been happening in sport over the last 10 or 15 years it's not just enough to say you've got a gold medal, you should be happy. It's about seeing the whole person. And that's exactly what the True Athlete Pur uh, Project talks about. It's exactly what Powered by Purpose has been set up to really empower. Um, and so I think it's really exciting to be at the cutting edge of that and leading it, leading it forwards. 
Um, I know that after Tokyo, um, the GB rowing team, we underperformed. Uh, we came home with two medals after a predicted five or six, I think was the target. Um, we had, I think, four or five crews that finished in fourth place. And there was a lot of finger pointing, a lot of questions. Um, and one of the statements the UK sport um, put out after the games was it has to be more than medals. Um, and I genuinely think that's part of the reason that this programme exists and why it's so important. Um, you can't have athletes coming home empty handed and thinking it wasn't worth it because they didn't have that one thing. Um, and having more strings to your bow, having more fingers in different pies, having your eggs in different baskets and something that feels meaningful, not only enriches your sport, but also I think protects you as a person, as an athlete um, and just expands the identities that you're allowed to inhabit. And that's a really good point that it expands you as a human being and, and a more balanced human being is going to perform better. We know that, right? But also within your sport, because uh, I think that's another gap, right? That within sport, uh, there isn't necessarily the idea that the pursuit is, is valuable in itself. Uh, we've become so fixated on medals right across the world. I mean, we're all following in the same path, right? Canada is doing the exact same thing. And then, and then Michael Phelps is left with his clank of clang all his medals, and they don't mean that much to him, right? He's feeling rather empty and dark and broken afterwards. So how do we also expand within sport to make it more meaningful? Yeah, really great points. Thanks, Imogen. Let's go to Georgia, and then let's come back as a group and talk a bit about some of those things we're trying to fix within the system of sport, what are the things that you see as gaps or that are broken or that we need to shift or change? And we'll come back to that in a minute. But Georgia, what got you engaged and uh, excited about this program powered by purpose? Um, I think kind of echo what Imogen said, it just came at the right time. Um, I remember seeing the email pop into my inbox. And I was like, oh, that, that looks really interesting. Um, I'd love to apply. I'm, I think it was pretty hot off the back of the Commonwealth Games when we didn't get that bronze. Um, so I think still feeling, feeling the sting from that, I was like, this is my chance. I can make change here. And it sounds like I'm just moaning because I didn't get a bronze medal. But this whole, the whole thing for me is more than this medal. The whole thing for the Padra Purpose, it's, excuse me, more than medals as well. Um, and I think and then it goes higher to UK sport, it's more than medals. Um, and I thought, oh, I can have a go and make change. If I was even to get it, I didn't think I was going to be accepted onto the program. Um, and just having been at the Commonwealth Games, it was my first international, and being on that world stage and thinking, people, as much as this medal means to me, the silver that we then got, I was like, as much as this means to me, it, couldn't mean anything to anyone else even my family um and it, it's not that relatable um and I think we're seeing athletes becoming more relatable in this shift that we're seeing Tom Daly for example he knits like that that's relatable diving off a 10 meter platform I don't think any, many of us can relate to here but making athletes more realistic and humanizing them um is really powerful and whilst someone might not be interested in me piloting someone they might be interested in the work that I'm passionate about within period periods period poverty active travel power inclusion and that that's why they would follow and be engaged in the purpose that I have um another thing was that oh, I totally forgot what I was going to say um that the the power of purpose thing it it kind of spoke that it didn't matter what interested you I think it it, it read that anyone could be involved it doesn't matter what you're interested in it does matter because you're interested in it and if you're passionate enough about it that then you're going to be able to make that change I think there's such pressure even on social media to be present and relevant. And actually it was bringing it all back to your core values and then going from there. 
and that's what inspires people people will be on board because they know it matters to you and they'll be even more on board with the the message like emos um you did uh veganuary and um some of the more eco-friendly stuff and you were like I, I don't care who sees it and if they hate it or if they love it and this worry of possibly receiving any bad comments on social media was kind of wiped out because we had these core values from powered by purpose um so it was kind of empowering us to feel to be empowered about the things we are passionate about it's kind of this trickle effect um that makes as human beings yeah and i've heard that the sting you know i used that word and i thought that was really interesting because i know i think you've all experienced a little sting that has then prompted an awakening and uh an engagement in this different kind of pathway hey um yes you maybe didn't get the medal or the, the there's some unfairness around that but it goes beyond a medal it's about the unfairness or the the process there's something wrong with the bureaucracy there and uh, the lock, I love uh, David's comment about the lockdown actually was an opening, right? We we're locked and yet that I think for many of us, this webinar was born of that as well too. Did you have that opportunity to reflect? Yeah, Lawrence. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on what Georgia said about the anybody's thing is acceptable on this program because that's where people are authentic and are following their their own passion and that's a shift away from what we've traditionally done in sport which is athletes are just used to go into a school and give a talk about their journey as an athlete or how cool it is being winning this gold medal and it's basically shown that that that's a really lovely afternoon for some kids but it doesn't have any particular lasting effect you need to do much more with those kids or with a group and so just supporting athletes in whatever that it is however small or big but whatever it is that they really want to do that's a much better route to more sustainable social impact so that's an, an, another kind of addition to all those benefits that come from supporting athletes in their thing so that it's actually more impact, impactful on the, on the long term and Imogen's point about the, the patriarchy you know so you through through sport you've seen this this model and how it's having to shift you also see it within this other context so the links that you're all making i see that with david as well you start to feel the ceilings or you start to encounter uh, barriers that you're you're supposed to somehow navigate and that brings you out into the rest of the world where these kind of issues are a factor as well right? what needs to change in sport so we have this wonderful program and it's supported by uk sport what else? What are some of the gaps you see in sport? How could it be leveraged more fully? Yeah, David, go ahead. Yeah, I think there's a, uh, in, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing it's different for each country depending on how successful the relative sports are. But in the UK, there definitely seems to be quite a, um, it's quite focused on like I guess you call the sexy sports, uh, like the football, the rugby, athletics, swimming um cycling to a degree um and then the other sports yeah, don't really get much of a look in um and in the paralympics it's kind of even more pronounced uh you just you, you're on a smaller pie um but the you know again you've still got the sports that get all the coverage like the athletics the wheelchair basketball wheelchair rugby is one that's popular obviously wheelchair basketball um but there are other fringe sports like you know power of table tennis watcher um that and shooting as well and don't always get the uh, the same um exposure um and and obviously then and then you've got the four year gap so you you have like four years you get all you get all your exposure in in like a month window and then it all just disappears again and you you're almost left in the wilderness so like yeah that was a great one um like um so yeah the, the disparity i think and the and I think we've got to get away from almost I, I just think valuing sport for what it is rather than like uh, obviously some sports uh, from an economical point of view do bring in more crowds and you know therefore have an an, an, ex, an extra value to them but I think uh, we can but I think um, it's not just about money and I think uh, we need to look at it from a, a societal point of view what what it can do for encouraging uh, like communication growth development um 
you know, have making making people feel more empowered. Um, and then, yeah, so that's kind of, for, for me, that would be the, the one thing that I would change is not necessarily make it um, equality of outcome, but definitely equality of opportunity. Um, and we're not, we're nowhere near that yet. Um, so like get the opportunity roughly on par. And then I think things would be quite interesting. Right. Because of that, everybody loves different things, right? So honoring that diversity. Other comments? We're all in pretty obscure sports, aren't we? <laughs> so we probably all experienced that. <laughs> yeah. I feel like it's general attitudes towards things like that like David said like Paralympics gets a two-week window where it's like oh that's cool um uh, moving on like that's how it feels my partner is well is also a pilot and he said the exact same thing he said you've got two weeks to make some kind of impact and that's not even on a social level that's just a oh, I ride a bike like please hello I'm here I just want a gold medal um and it, it's that and whilst there are para sports involved in the Commonwealth Games and we just had a Super Worlds um, for cycling um, up in Glasgow with every kind of cycling involved from para, um, and I think there was cycle ball. Um, there was the, just every single type of cycling that some of us cyclists went, what, there's this? Um, just things like that. It's just more inclusion and just opening everyone's eyes to like the beauty that is sport and that it comes in sh different shapes sizes and each sport is valid in its own right no matter if it's olympic paralympic not even a you olympic paralympic sport um the ones that you don't see are the ones that we love the best sometimes like obviously curling is a olympic sport but it everyone loves that when that comes on so let's keep it going let's let's keep it going for another three years in between those cycles um so yeah it's just general attitudes whether that's general public or even national governing bodies like the disparity i would sometimes see within my own sport um well and we're breaking the myths aren't we of who brings in the box office if we do have that economic argument you know we're starting to we're definitely our universities are playing with that where giving the women the same amount of exposure or the time slots and and noticing that the same people come it doesn't affect it or you know soccer's getting the same crowds Man, amazing yeah. invest in people how everything can work out I saw that that female college volleyball game that got 90,000 people like right. the, the, wow. there's a there's the support there yeah yeah so what is this hierarchy based on, you know, either whether it's about the sexy sports or this assumption that it's about money, like that we build these false hierarchies. Uh, how do we break that? Or what, why does it need to be broken? David's made a great point about diverse interests. We need to value sport for its sake. And what else? I, I think definitely I'm just maybe connecting both of Georgia and David's points coming back to kids sports when when you're first offering sports and how that's valued by society and generally undervalued financially it's in schools that are struggling kind of financially this will it's sport art drama the first ones to be cut and that's a that's one of the biggest travesties of our education system i think if we could fund and value sport at that age and keep keep kids and people in sport for their lifelong whatever it is but more botcher more curling not everyone wants to play rugby and cricket or the equivalents in Canada and America. Um, you'd have a totally different demographic, just understanding, appreciation of sport and, and all the diversity of sport. I feel like what we all have as sports people, especially having survived in sport for this long, is a, a lasting love and passion for a sport. And as you say, we're all sitting here, none of us are footballers, none of us are multimillionaires. Um, a lot of the time we're showing up because it's fun and because we love it and I think part of the reason that we're so passionate about what we are passionate about is because the idea of someone not experiencing that joy and that dedication is really sad mm -hmm. um, you know we we may lose people in a lot of different ways and sometimes that might be a lack of interest and sometimes it's doors closing um, and I think 
as sports people, we're really good at looking at a long-term goal and breaking it down into small steps. We're really good at persevering in the face of adversity. We're really good at trying to root for the underdog. And so I think as sports people, it's very easy for us to see ways forwards because this is how we've been trained to think and problem solve for years. Um, and maybe one of the things that needs to change is us as sports people actually speaking up and presenting these solutions um, more widely and, and continuing to push that forwards. Um, you know, in the past, it hasn't always been um, acceptable for an athlete to have a stance on a social issue. And that's certainly changed. Uh, and so I think to some extent, it's also our responsibilities to try and to try and push the change from the inside while we're here and, and passionate and visible. Well, rule 50, right? I mean, it's really against the law to speak out on the podium or use that um, literal platform. Um, yes, love it. We're speaking out. And what has prompted that? What's fostered it? Definitely programs like this, but there's been a wave, a uh, riptide really of voice from athletes. Yeah. I think it's extremely interesting. Um, having conversations with people about their stance on morality and, and whether sport should be political. Uh, Cause I feel like athletes probably have a very different view to someone who might just be a casual observer of a football game. Um, like you're saying rule 50 and, and understanding actually a lot of the time there might even be a regulation stopping you from speaking out and actually the, then the consequences will then fall directly on you if something is to happen, which almost makes it even more important. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, I was just gonna yeah add to that like it's quite strict on those sorts of things. Like you get fined, uh, worse you don't get to like race or you know selected. There's impingements for yeah. There's impingements for speaking out sometimes um and I feel like uh, one of your things then was like what made this shift and I think people younger athletes are seeing the change come through that older athletes are now passionate about things that they've always been passionate about but it's after they've retired um whereas younger athletes are now going oh no hold on I can do both mm -hmm. and that that's okay and that's probably good sometimes that we can do both things and be passionate while we're in like that bit is changing except when you're on the podium um that you can speak out about there being better equality or better inclusion within your ngb um i i actually did the the speech i did for tap when we did our final day at uk sport i did that in front of our british cycling staff um on their team day and um that was me directly saying like there are differences between the olympic and paralympic sides um like part of it can come from the staff and their attitudes to what they think is legitimate or not legitimate um within the their sport and another thing i went to was actually the uk sport uh leadership research review um i don't exactly think that's what it was called but someone had done a study on um females within leadership roles of ngbs or um international governing bodies and their barriers within that um so if you haven't got you know women at the top or anyone more diversity at the top of making these decisions, making these rules, um, then it's not going to be considered. Well, that's how it feels, that it's not going to be considered. Um, and I think even that structure of who's at the top of an international governing body or like the UCI, or it's more voted by not just those in there and it's not as... Um, corrupts maybe a strong word but you know the athletes of cycling can vote for that and it's not about people gaining votes through friendships or other means um was kind of what i learned from that day um that that 
could and should change a bit. Absolutely. How can you support diversity if you aren't actually diverse, right? Those minds. Yeah. David, and then... I agree with that. I think it's. Uh, I think diversity is a. In botcher, diversity kind of is a is a multi multi faceted issue. Um, in our sport, we we've got a very um, we got a very white uh, group. Uh, we 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 we're, we're all quite aware of that, um, and mostly male as well. Um, in our in this athlete group, um, and as a leadership group, we we're coming together, and and it is it's something that we talk about quite often. Is like how do we and and there are many issues and the other in terms of the staffing group there isn't a single disabled athlete on that staffing group that manages the most disabled paralympic sport like what well, uh, it's bizarre, like, isn't it that's like yeah the most inclusive disabled paralympic sport and there's not a single disabled person on the in the staffing group at all uh, the only person that has any sort of original links to disability is a former OT that's now our performance lifestyle advisor. Um, but she's still able-bodied, <laughs> uh, which is interesting. So that's, so yeah. So, and then, and because of that, we end up struggling with development. So the issues like getting new players into the, into the sport, um, even just understanding what it's like to have a, a carers and what it's like to deal with, uh, society's barriers um, around accessibility and travel and all that stuff like um it almost <laughs> it's almost like the staff go through like a year's or two years probation trying to figure out all the all the minefields that we have to deal with on a daily basis um, yeah, um and they still don't, and, and they still don't always get it um so yeah it's which is quite amusing but it's it, it just shows and that makes the, the development of the sport difficult then because you you, you can't attract uh, the players because it's like because there's not a lot of um, understanding or empathy as to like what it actually not just what it takes to be an athlete but what it takes to be a severely disabled athlete um yeah it's just like yeah nuts so uh yeah it's something that we're acutely aware of <laughs> and you're right it's chronic it just becomes a cycle perpetuation yes lawrence has yeah. too. i was just gonna back up george's point about the changing dynamic um shifting generations perhaps but some of the research that uk sport did to as a foundation for powered by purpose they showed that 84 percent of current funded athletes want to use their platform for some good outside of their sport whilst they're still competing so that's something that's that's a that's a major shift exactly like georgia said that previously both society wanted that from athletes just keep your head down your job is to perform but athletes also kind of towed that line so that's a big shift. But also, as Imogen said, that <clears throat> over 60% of the general public want athletes to be role models for something, to stand up for something and and use their platform. So there's <clears throat> there's a shifting zeitgeist both within athletes who are younger and more purpose-driven, as I think we know younger generations tend to be, and and society kind of wanting and, and hoping for that from their from these athlete role models. Which I feel like it's a route to success as well in terms of um, engagement in sport too. Um, you know, we've seen the rise of the incredibly successful Netflix documentaries that follow people within sports. You know, F one or uh, tennis or, or rugby. There's there's loads of them, and the key um, commonality between all of them is the story. They've got a good story. Right. Um, and what's a better story than an athlete with a purpose? Uh, I feel like it kind of comes hand in hand. As soon as you have someone who's standing for more than just their sport, you suddenly got a better story there and you're going to have more interest. I thought you were going to say the humanity was the common thread, Emo, because that's what I think connects. I definitely I bought in. I'm such a fan of all of them. I'd happily watch because you're seeing the people who are doing the sports finally you're seeing really what they're struggling with and that they're actually a bit anxious and doubting and all of that. You're right, the story's there as well, but that's, that that also supports your point that when you when your athletes are doing this stuff, you see a little bit behind them doing their sport to what they care about and, yeah, them as people acting in the world. 
and the interaction between, you know, I look at all of you beautiful individuals and how then you interact with the sport that you're involved in, as well as your other activities. But, you know, you bring and then the sport brings and pow, all the spark comes. It, I know it's not a chicken or egg. I don't think that, you know, you're all very ambitious, high achievers, you know, very insightful, thoughtful, powerful people who have come to sport for sure. But also sport has then pushed you, right? Has fueled you. What, what part of your sport do you think or in what ways has sport taught you uh, or inspired you to pursue different passions? What role does the sport itself play? Going backwards in a boat, Imogen. <laughs> you know, because people do think, oh, it's so boring. It's just repetitive. But you and I know it's a billion things are in your brain every stroke you take. You know, in what way has has rowing infused your path, your journey, your purpose? I mean, in so many ways. Um, I think the one that I touch on here is probably the, the part of sport that has had the biggest impact on me personally is probably sports psychology. Um, as a rower, um, I was introduced to rowing through the boat race, which is an eight, and every eight has nine people in it, and eight of them need to row perfectly in time 35 to 40 times a minute without making mistakes for minutes and minutes on end. Um, and that might sound like a technical and physical problem, but so often it's a psychological problem. And coming from a background of not having done a lot of sport before, that was the biggest piece of the pie that I didn't understand. Um, and it was only through understanding sports psychology, understanding how teamwork works, understanding the ebb and flow of positivity, be a radiator, not a drain, understanding how to have hard conversations and also understanding how to work with a coach, how to work with someone who might have more authority than you, but in a way that's productive um, and how to lift up your teammates and all in all how to go faster as a unit. Um, I think that's been the most transformative part for me learning all of those things thank you what else? I, feel free I definitely to i'd echo that it's the most transformative part of my journey as well and it was a period where it was the darkest time of my life through injury right before an olympics that i got to work and really understand that psychology and that the effect of kind of working with my values and some other other wonderful things drawing me into a much better place just gave me this realization of like we we don't do this as a as society we don't train people in these ways athletes shouldn't be the only ones who get to experience understanding your own brain and how to help yourself and be the best that you can be this should be what we do with with everybody that was definitely the starting that kind of that's those are the seeds that led to me joining tap and doing it and then everything else yeah. I definitely feel like a lot of officers would be a better place to be if they had some sports like sessions. Right? <laughs> yeah. I, n hearing that, I'm like, yeah, like I, sometimes you wish uh, some people can look at things objectively, like when you'd have to in a training session or something. Um, I can relate to that a lot. Um, uh, my transformative part, though, is maybe a bit different to you both. It was more that I kind of found cycling when I was 18. Um, and to be put it bluntly, I found it through failure. I messed up my A-levels, which were other qualifications in the UK that get you into university. Um, and I had this dream that I was going to go and be a vet. Um, so I totally flunked my A-levels, ended up in Manchester, and I'd signed up for a talent ID event um, and then cycling picked me from my data. Um, and I entered this whole new world of trying to cook for an 18 year old who really couldn't cook. And then the new me, who was then this athlete um, that I, I was the horsey girl at school who thought PE was the Olympics. So I wasn't the best mix, but um, I was now this athlete um that I never thought I'd be and certainly not on two wheels um and finding this new sport was kind of made me passionate and seeing all these other women within the the gym all these other athletes kind of going against the social norm of being 
skinny there were these women lifting double their body weight in front of me and I was like this is amazing this is exactly who and what I want to be um someone's just challenged the norm um and then secondary to that joining the para program and just that was a whole new world for me I'd seen it I trained with some of the para athletes and actually being on the program and seeing that everyone's different outlooks on life whether they were born with their disability or acquired it later in life um being around those mindsets was really empowering um and learning like what power athletes go through on a daily basis not only like David said not only are they training to be the best but they've also got to go home and like for stokers they've got to find their way around the house and know how to live um in a society that doesn't make it easy at the best of times um and like I, I made my mistakes being on the power program and saying to a stoker like just like in my naivety uh, I said just go in a straight line just when we do a start just go in a straight line and the stoker said to me like I've never seen a straight line and that's kind of the moment where I went oh my gosh like it blew my mind that I and it embarrassed me that I'd been grown up in such a narrow-minded world um and that well I had a lot to learn um but that there's so much more than just being that athlete um and that even though I'm not a power athlete I can still be passionate about it um from the experiences that I've seen them go through and what they've told me about and what I've seen between the squads yeah. you've come full circle now Georgia you're back to you're going to be on the yeah. being a vet yes my five-year plan is back on track <laughs> but yeah um it was nice. uh, you know the nicest nicest sidetrack ever and they kind of somehow hopefully will go hand in hand um be nice to make it back for the Commonwealth Games <laughs> next time but we'll see <laughs> Really interesting, you know, um, learning through sport around questioning assumptions and this idea of just complete, uh, up, um, I don't know, kind of serendipity, you know, and opportunity that can come out of nowhere. Possibility is the word I was looking yeah. for. Yeah. And sorry, uh, to add to that, I so, like you guys both said, I wish there was a sports psych in an office. I'm like, you know what? I wish there was a power athlete in the office as well to show them that what they go through on a daily basis. And I think it would stagger so many people because um, I think David alluded to it, maybe in his talk um, at, when we were at UK sport, he was like, we're labeled as superhumans. Um, but I'd love someone to just sit down for a day with Sophie Unwin and talk about, what she goes through on a daily basis and or even David yourself like those experiences yeah my experience of how sport transformed my uh, sort of experience uh, it transformed my life it's probably it, it's kind of weird because obviously sports psychology love it um because my biggest issue has always been my head. Um, uh, and boccia is a very, very psychological sport. I mean, all sports are psychological, but boccia takes it to, yeah, it can be quite brutal at times. So, um, yeah, that that took me a while to figure that out. So understanding myself is definitely something I can relate to, but it probably wasn't. Yeah, I started the sport so such a long time ago, damn, I feel old, um, that the uh, that, that's, that sort of stuff was still in, the, in its infancy. Um, so... Um, back in 2008, I literally, I, I just rocked up to a Paralympic Games as a pretty much a happy amateur, and uh, we picked up a team goal. But the the the, the legacy that that would lead, and the uh, the opportunities that came before and after that, um, for me, it's been it's crazy. So, someone with my sort of disability in the in the normal world, let's say outside of sport, um, would be really struggling to live independently. Would be you know would be sort of forced to accept the situation they're in 
sometimes through their own uh through what they see and what they just don't believe in and 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 sometimes because society just isn't uh geared up for showing them all the options that are available um so for me for example i've had the best physios for the last 12 years um so um, i've got scoliosis of the spine and it's basically we've managed to get me out i turned down a, a, a surgeon uh six weeks before the Paralympic Games in Beijing. Um, and his medical professional opinion was that I needed to have the operation. Um, but I decided not to um, because I wanted to go to Beijing. Um, so he, you know, there, there's always in, it's always been said, you know, you'll, you'll feel it in your 30s. It will start coming back to haunt you, blah, 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 blah. Um, and all the work that I've done with my physio since, um, I, my, my back's never felt better. Um, my my spine is stable and um, I'm more able than I ever have than I ever was in my in my 20s um it's transformed my relationship with physios and those sort of people because when I was a kid I was pretty much tortured um as a severely disabled person um we used to call it physio torture because they used to string you up in all sorts of weird medieval contraptions to try and make you look walk or look straight um, because that's what they thought you were supposed to do. Um, and so I was tortured from the age of about five to 11 um, on a daily basis, um, with purely on the pursuit of being able to walk, even though it was never going to happen. Um, and I'd accepted that when I was about six. Um, <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, so my relationship with medical people and physios was very, very scarred at that point. And then you had to relearn that. Um, but Botcher gave me the opportunity to build those relationships with um, professionals again, to learn how to say no <laughs> to people that suggest things, um, but also to take say yes to the things that are, have potential um, and to and to look at the bigger picture, not just you know, not just uh, stick in your lane as it were. Um, like I said, being able to travel the world, uh, being able to drive, being able to live in a city that's 170 miles away from my parents, you know, there's lots of people my age uh, with my sort of disability that still live with their parents um and because they, they they their parents believe there's no one in the world that could possibly look after them like uh like they could so there's a bit of letting go issues there but great thing with botcher was it meant i could get i could pull away <laughs> um i could fly off into the sunset and then come back when i wanted um so that was kind of that's what sport's done for me um and obviously i'm you know soon going to be a homeowner happy days um and yeah just that those opportunities don't come around for people like me um in in normal society um so so it's almost really it actually really frustrating in a in a way that um we said earlier about like i've seen all these things that could do wonders for society psychology wellness nutrition sleep <laughs> uh, you know even like managing jet lag it could be useful for some people that don't sleep very well um and yeah it's quite frustrating to see uh like having all this knowledge and not being able to share it so that's why i'm a lifestyle coach as well yeah good and and thus the pro the program right you know you're coming through sport you're learning all these things developing these this wisdom and insight and and purpose and passion and our leaders right? and your leaders coming in probably too and i mean leaders as in you know you're inspired and you're driven and you're seeking meaning in in the light in the world and in your lives but you're coming out even more equipped through sport and so what's next and how can you you know we heard from georgia we need people we need people in these positions of leadership that reflect some of the purposes that you talk about what are your plans I think in general uh, a lot of it's about momentum um, and uh, a large part of my journey through the power by purpose program as well was just taking the next step even if it was small um, and for me it, I didn't see kind of results straight away I wasn't great at speaking about sustainability which is one of my passions straight away but now 12 and a bit months down the line from having started the program I do feel re really equipped and I feel like I'm making a lot of progress um and I think it, a responsibility does 
then lie on our shoulders because we are more knowledgeable and more equipped. Um, and it's about keeping putting ourselves out there and keeping talking about the things we're passionate about, even when it feels hard and even when it feels scary. Um, there's an interesting balance, I think, between personal action and more uh, institutional action, I suppose, is the thing as well. Um, trying to balance where to put your energy because it's a lot easier to speak out about something as a lone voice because you just have to agree with yourself which is most of the time an easy thing to do but we all know that we can have a bigger impact if we can hold hands with more people and rely on the power of the group and kind of working towards that is is something that I'm really trying to work towards um it's something I'm focusing on at the moment Love that expression, holding hands. I often say link arms. I just heard someone say lock arms the other day. Yeah. And I love that we agree with ourselves pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah. So how to how to find your people. Okay. Excellent. Who who else? What are your plans? Where are you going next? What have you, you know, what are your next steps as leaders? Yeah, I, uh, I, I, I can't agree with that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, go on, continue. <laughs> I mean, I kind of agree with um, in terms of with image and in terms of like, yeah, it, it's bringing my biggest issue is I got I'm like the bus driver that doesn't let people jump on the bus. So I'm the I'm the guy that's, you know, foot to the floor. Go, go, go. So my 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 next step is how do I bring people with me? All these ideas, all the motivation in the world, lots of fuel. Um, but I don't want an empty bus. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to wait and let the keep the door open um, for a bit longer. Okay, what are you, what? How are you doing that? What's one of the things that you're thinking about? So I'm doing quite a lot of work at the moment around sort of gradually sharing my ideas with people that are sort of similar experiences to me, um, who maybe aren't quite as uh, maybe in a different level at stage of their sporting career or potentially um, like not not yet ready to kind of push, but have a similar similar ambitions but just aren't in that frame yet but kind of just i'm gently prodding <laughs> slowly gently prodding and sort of nudging into come with me uh kind of thing and just encouraging a little bit and yeah um there's work within within our sport as well now in terms of how we're as athletes because we used to all just do our own things um a little bit um which you know it's fine because we're uh but uh we I think we will come to the realization now that uh, we're probably we're, we're we're strong as individuals, but we're probably we're quite a lot stronger as a group. Um, formidable, I would say. Um, so um, it's yeah, it's quite exciting that there's, there's five of us that have started banging our heads together. Um, so yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a very strong group of people that I wouldn't want to mess with. <laughs> <laughs> you need uh capes probably as well yeah um love that metaphor of the bus like that's a really useful image right of pulling up and inviting inviting people to join you and keeping space on the bus <laughs> instead of roaring yeah. i love it what else georgia um yeah my main focus at the minute is probably the women in sport stuff um which has conveniently interlinked with the active travel passions that I have. Um, there's an event, I think, next week. I think it's about women re reclaiming the streets. And a few of those are the counsellors I met at the Kiddical Mass. Um, so it's about not being harassed on a bike ride or on your walk to work, anything in between. Um, and I think, hopefully, I should be getting a few of the other uh, GB girls on board with that um because I think unfortunately we can all relate to it um so I think that's well the most up-to-date thing that's coming um and then just I think I'm joining a uh British fencing camp later down the line in December um speaking about my experience as a female in sport and how that's impacted me and opening up discussions about how to deal with periods during competition days training days um and how i would deal with that um and hopefully making that a more comfortable conversation for athletes to have with each other with coaches family friends um and just making that a fine topic com topic of conversation to have um and yeah just getting young girls talking 
and staying in the sport. Lauren, Lawrence, Lawrence. 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 well, so I like what Imogen was saying about momentum, and that's what it's all about for us from our point of view as well. Obviously, my work in this space is largely coming through tap and power by purpose and we are noticing already a lot of interest in it as you as you'd imagine this is a pioneering thing from uk sport one of the kind of top governing bodies in world sport so it, the news is getting around and and people are interested so um that's that's one part and just i think as these stories come out things like this webinar there we're just seeing opportunities kind of coming in more and more regularly for people wanting kind of athletes from the power by purpose program to contribute to to whatever it is hearing the stories like this it's just gonna it's gonna normalize it it's gonna um kind of shine light on all of these kind of multifaceted really wonderful diverse broad kind of benefits that are coming from it and and just people will get the sense of that we do it makes perfect sense of course this is what we want to be doing as athletes and supporting our athletes and this is what we want to hear and kind of as a public we want from our athletes um this is how we want them to be superhuman actually is like on the pitch as well is great but in these other ways it's awesome um and just we have some fairly strong anecdotal evidence uh from just this pilot cohort that being on the program and being at least in this space is really beneficial for performance and we've believed this for a long time this overlapping circles of well-being performance social impact that it makes total sense to us that if you have this kind of interest and identity and passion outside of your sport it relieves it, then suddenly identity and sense of self-worth is not wrapped up in whether you win that medal or win that match or race and you're just when you're there you're just free to perform there's nothing more hanging over you because you have so much there's so much more to you and we've seen some pretty remarkable kind of results, like well, like personal best just in those months and year after the people joining the program. Anecdotal, but <laughs> but it totally. I think I'm I'm totally buying that. I think we'll see more and more of that. Yeah, it felt like every month or just for each session we had when we were on the program, it was like, oh, well done to this person. They're a world champion, or well done to this person. They've just won a medal. So I might relate to that because I was like, oh, my days, <laughs> this group, like, it works. Beautiful. Okay, we've got a few more minutes, and I'm so glad you're able to stay, David. Um, awesome. Uh, this last question, and you'll remember I sent it out to you beforehand, this idea that, you know, we often think of sport as inherently good. It's the moral good, you know, and yet we're confronted with so many stories right now of all the issues, corruption, cheating, violence, abuse. And it, the list goes on and they keep flooding in, I know, into all my channels for sure. And Jay Coakley talks about it being kind of a myth. I'm not sure I agree with that, but I do think there's something that ensures like beyond, it's not just going to happen. You start sport and suddenly you become empowered and a leaderly and all these wonderful things just naturally. There have to be some factors that facilitate your development. So a program like this that runs parallel with your competition, your uh, your training, that's great. That can help. What else? What are, what do you think has contributed through your sport experience? What are the factors, the people, the types of um, the elements of your experience that have contributed to really building you into a, a strong, and, and they're not always positive, right? Sometimes it is about failure, learning from that failure, but then how do we facilitate the failure? And what are some of those critical components? Comments on that? I'll, I'll leave the other, these guys to answer the question, but I'll just say I heard a wonderful statement by ex-NBA, British NBA player, John Amici, who said that sport is an empty vessel. You fill it with anything that you want, or it gets filled with stuff that you don't want. So I, I think that makes total sense. It's There's something there, but it's it, it's what we make of it. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Over to you guys. Yeah. I mean, we can all agree on its transformative nature, um, sort of preaching to the choir here on that one. Um, I think sport is so fantastic because it's so flexible and can be so varied. Um, but with that, it can then be exploited and abused um the power that it can hold 
um the word integrity springs to mind um I think if a sport or a sporting body has integrity you're probably on the right track and kind of furthering that as well I think um for me understanding like the positive sides of sport really came from understanding my values and how sport fit into those values and how my sport embodied those values um and that's something that's been really impactful and I think works on a sporting team level but also works on a wider sport level as well and I heard you really express that so well when you talked about those nine individuals being synchronized and how how difficult it's not just a physical or a tactical thing it's very much a a psychological emotional component and then what do you mean by integrity what are some examples of that of where you've seen superb integrity of action behavior structures I think sometimes it's hard to put a finger on it necessarily. Um, Examples that spring to mind when I think of a sport that has integrity is the level of respect that a rugby referee or umpire is given. Um, The way that the rules work in Ultimate Frisbee, um, assuming that it wasn't a malicious um, mistake. It wasn't a malicious action, it was just a mistake. And that's the way that play is restarted. Um, You know, talking about um truth and openness um in other sports um I'm struggling to think of examples but uh that's I think to me what integrity means in sport beautiful and have you had experiences of it or someone you know you've um, worked with or that you've trained with that you feel like they kind of emulate that or processes that are really just um a lot of open communication um the sporting unit that I'm in at the moment um is awesome uh it's me my doubles partner and my coach is kind of the trio that we work with at the moment um and I think one of the most impactful things when we first came together was having a conversation almost setting out the intentions of the project before we even began and entering into that agreement all together And I don't think that focus has ever wavered. Um, And I think that means that we're able to act within the framework that we've already set down and therefore act with integrity. Beautiful. It's partnership. Hey, I push for that a lot in the work that I do. Instead of this hierarchy of authority, it's really, you you know, because the coach is nothing without you and you need the help of the coach. So it's really as you say, a project that you're all engaging in. Love that. And the agreement that you set out ahead of time. What else? What are the critical factors that have fostered uh, a leader in David Smith or Georgia Holt or Lawrence? Because Lawrence, you can share from your fencing perspective too, right? Mm -hmm. I think um, for me, the, uh, so my, so probably up until 2012, I was still, finding my way in the sport um obviously I I found success very quickly um and then my issue wasn't necessarily winning it was staying there um so once people know who you are they start you become the target it's all like the the monkey on your back and people are you it's a double-edged sword you're expected to win and you got people raising their game to beat you so you, you got two 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 pronged attack the coaches are never satisfied and the and the players that are trying to beat you are uh, um are still trying to beat you so um so that was kind of learning to deal with that was quite difficult um and then but i think for me the you said about partnership that for me that was probably the thing that really kickstarted my 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 era of dominance from about 2014 up until maybe yeah well still ongoing really i'm trying to keep it ongoing for as long as possible um but so from 2014 until now my dominance uh sort of stems from the partnerships i created so the first person that i partnered up with was my sports assistant sarah so she's been with me uh, as a sports assistant um since 2011 uh, she has to do my personal care as well when we're on competitions but she's basically my golfer's caddy so she knows all about the balls she we talk tactics and stuff uh, she's not a coach uh but she's you know on court she's the one that tells me what in between ends we have conversations she's the one that either tells me to pull my finger out of my ass or to give me a you know yeah that's all right you're still in control all that stuff um stuff i need to hear um and she was the first person that took a long time to understand me because i'm quite complicated and sports psychology came in then and that's where 
um, with my sports psychologist. Um, spent a long time analysing my sort of insights profile and uh, and sort of figuring out where where my sort of weaknesses were and you know what are the red flag you know things that we need to you know when I'm on court what do I need to stay confident. Um, so that was big that she spent that much time trying to understand me where no one else had in the past. So she gained my trust. And then, and then we had this plan together to, you know, medal in London 2012. And then, and then after that, the dominance came in when I started trusting the physios um, and, and rebuilt the uh, sort of relationships from uh, traumatic childhood. So she, uh, so Dawn was our lead physio at that point. She's now the head of, uh, our sports um because she's pretty cool um but she 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 sort of came on board and it would be we came like a triad so me sarah and dawn it was almost like that was my support structure my individual that's you know those are the people that i'm you know all in on um so she was the one that came up with ideas for my you know my change of being uh my medical stuff that made me a better player, but also fixed my health. Well, improved my health. Um, and yeah, so those things sort of then, you know, I'm a relatively middle of the road in my category playing against players that are quite significantly more able than I am. Um, yet I make up the difference through the technology that I use and the, the, the support I have and the maximizing my disability, making the best of it. Um, so that's, that's where I gain the, 15, 20% on people. Um, and uh, yeah, that was the plan from the beginning. And we carried on. And then Glenn, my coach from 2016, sort of, he was the one that became the driver of that, the, 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 uh, to help me maintain, because, uh, you know, it's quite easy to go up and down. So he was the one that sort of, we come up with the invincibility agenda, which was essentially, essentially, not that I couldn't ever lose because that's un that's impossible, um, but I was going to be bloody difficult to beat. And uh, yeah, it wouldn't matter. Like people would fear me um, and I, I could, you know, basically any situation I've got a, a, a weapon to fight back with. Um, so that was sort of from Rio to Tokyo, really. And those things are, you know, the lessons you learn along the way and the people you work with, but those really close relationships with certain people um, meant that we could, you know, we've done some crazy things in my category. Um, and, and I, you know, I see my impact around the world and, and how my category is now playing the game. But I, I can actually see people copying me. I can see people copying how I play, trying to catch up with me, which is awesome. Um, so, you know, and w my category was always the one that was sort of considered to be the weakest category. And, you know, the standard of botch is not quite the same as the other categories. And now that's bullshit. Um, like, so, yeah. I'm hearing so much care, like that they took the time to get to know you as a unique oh. individual and your complexity. And and earlier, George and I go way back as we were uh, partners in this project last year, but we're chatting before the webinar about care and how there's a bit of a an attitude in sport, well, a lot of an attitude in sport, a very like you're disposable, right? That uh, you, you win the medal or you don't if you don't you're out and talent id is kind of too it can be very ruthless and yet there's so much value in the actual investment of getting to know someone and we're seeing the results of that in the invincibility agenda which i'm stealing immediately by the way okay and georgia um or lawrence yeah for my i guess coming into leadership or wanting change i think I only realized how much I felt I wanted to change or felt I could be a leader of change by joining Powered by Purpose. Um, and we did one webinar on that core values. And then when we spoke, um, uh, I kind of spoke about my values and I was like, and then you'll never guess what happened at the Commonwealth Games. This happened. And you were like, well, that goes against your values. And I, was, I remember just being sat there like, oh my gosh my whole life has just all been pieced together and then when I then reflected on that and I went back and I thought oh so that's why this situation when I was training on track and you know another squad got prioritized over our Paris squad that were organized to go beforehand oh I now know why that irked me or I now know why 
the Commonwealth Games thing irked me so much um, that it wasn't about a medal, it's about power inclusion, and that that was actually one of my values as well, it turned out. Um, so I think that was probably instrumental in me then reflecting and realising where all this passion comes from. Um, and like I said, be, being talent ID'd when I was going through such a rough time being a, well, for me, a totally different city and um, living a totally new life. Um, that experience of being thrusted into a, an environment I knew nothing about. I don't know what way to ride around the track. Um, and I remember asking that. <laughs> um, uh, and then being put on the front of a tandem and not being forced to lead, but having that leadership position of keeping someone safe, advocating for them when we needed to, i.e. Commonwealth Games or um, even a daily track session that oh, we're going first, That that's the end of it. Um, when those situations arise, I now know why. Um, I would maybe take that leadership stance. Um, and as a young girl being told, oh no, you, you, you can't go and play rugby. You can't go and do that. There's not even a women's team that I, I don't want that for any young child, uh, male, female, that they can't do what they think they want to do. Um, and changing that to be better. And that all aligns with my values of transparency, loyalty, inclusion, um, and passion. And that kind of rings true to why I, I find it easy to be passionate about maybe harder subjects, um, like more, well, not that none of these are political subjects, um, but happy to tackle these quite head on um because i know I've, I've seen people's lived experiences i've heard their anecdotes um and been alongside them experiencing these sorts of things i mean hearing a lot of that partnership concept or you know trusting someone else working with others but the respect and agreement you know and equity and managing story and the the actual interest investment care from david and then the intervention right someone that can come in and help you arrive at uh give you the opportunity challenge you or something like that like like this program but other experiences you've had too and lawrence how about you what are some of the critical factors you think necessary clearly like i agree like education some kind of opportunity to actually reflect and distill um but what else so as we everyone was talking i and especially as you summed up the kind of care element i kind of come back to the fact that i I was very lucky I had a coach who followed me from the age of seven when I started, an incredible kids coach, probably the best in the country, all the way up to Olympic level. He also happened to be the best coach in the country by far for the elite level. And he was just somebody absolutely loved the sport, had a great passion for it and wanted to just bring everybody on board with fencing. And the this idea of care we talk about this a lot in tap as well and this is so central to what we want the vision our vision of sport is is that you care for the person before you care for the results that they give and the performance they make and that's what i had from this guy it was this coach was um i knew just without any any thought that it didn't matter what the result was any even up into the olympics and world championship it was not going to affect our relationship how he thought about me he was uh, he was only going to treat me with with love basically one way or the other um and it's only since in the last kind of eight years or so since since retiring since being older that i realized that's so rare for the first part and so impactful so if that's if we can give people anyone pe classes kids in school elite level athletes anyone talent pathways anyone that experience of being cared for regardless but still with the passion and like he was a brilliant coach the the technical knowledge the the drive the ambition then then that changes that changes everything you know you've inspired me to write my coach <laughs> and you know just let them know right how much they meant how and how why like why they meant so much to you and what they were providing because it does take a bit to really distill it all doesn't it 
Thank you all. That's our time. And I'm so appreciative of all the time that you've provided. I we all do our, I think we will all do our very best to share this out. There's so many great pearls in here for people to uh, to take in and reflect on themselves. So thank you all. You're also inspiring education in and through sport as you share your wisdom today. So thanks again and good luck everyone and all your endeavors. I know you're all pursuing many things, which is the healthiest way to go. And we'll uh, talk soon. Take care.